Hey there folks and welcome back. I have one more example for you today on Lagrange multipliers and this is a cool one. It's about profit maximization so it should be interesting and relevant to everyone. Now although this is currently phrased as an economics problem, an example like this could easily be adapted to the sciences or engineering. Here we're dealing with a firm, Zaki Snacks Foods Limited, and they produce three types of snacks. On snacks of type 1, they earn $4 of profit per unit. On snacks of type 2, $8 of profit per unit. And on snacks of type 3, $6 of profit per unit. Now they can't just produce as much as they want. They have certain limitations they have to work with. So if X, Y, and Z represent the number of snacks the company produces of types 1, 2, and 3 respectively, then X squared plus 2Y squared plus Z squared has to be less than or equal to 756. This is their production constraint. We need to find the values of X, Y, and Z that maximize the company's profits. Now I told you this was a Lagrange multiplier problem, right? So we must have a function that we're trying to optimize and a constraint that has to be met. Well, what function are we trying to maximize or minimize here? In this case, we're maximizing the firm's profits. We're told how much profit the firm earns per snack of each type. And so its total profit is going to be $4 times the number of snacks of type 1, that's 4x, plus $8 times the number of snacks of type 2, that's 8y, and finally $6 times the number of snacks of type 3, 6z. So there's our profit function, f of x, y, z. What about our constraint? Well, the constraint was given to us pretty explicitly. We know that x squared plus 2y squared plus z squared must be less than or equal to 756. So this guy here is going to be our constraint function g of x, y, z. All right, well, if we're trying to maximize this function f subject to this constraint, we know a couple of things. We know that the global max of our function could either occur at a critical point inside or at some extreme point along the boundary. The boundary looks complicated, so we're going to tackle this with the method of Lagrange. At the end, we'll check for any critical points inside. So starting with the boundary, we want to maximize f subject to the constraint x squared plus 2y squared plus z squared equals 756. If we're using the method of Lagrange, we first have to make sure that the gradient of g is not zero at any point along this constraint curve. So let's compute the gradient of g. We have that del g is 2x, 4y, 2z. What would it mean for this gradient to be equal to zero? Well, if you look at each line separately, you'll see that x has to be zero, y has to be zero, and z has to be zero. Ah, but if that's the case, then the left-hand side of our equation, x squared plus 2y squared plus z squared, would evaluate to zero, not 756. So what we conclude is that there are no points on our constraint curve where the gradient of g is equal to zero. We can now move on to step two. Okay, now that we've verified that the gradient of g is not zero along this boundary curve, we're ready to solve our Lagrange equation. Gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g. So we have to compute these gradients. The gradient of f is given by 4, 8, 6. And on the last slide, we already computed the gradient of g. On the right side of this equation, we get lambda times 2x, 4y, 2z. And finally, we have our constraint curve, x squared plus 2y squared plus z squared equals 756. Just like before, we're going to unpack this vector equation to get a system of four equations. We have 4 equals 2 lambda x, 8 equals 4 lambda y, 6 equals 2 lambda z, and x squared plus 2y squared plus z squared equals 756. We'll label these equations as 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, folks, we got to solve this system for all solutions x, y, z. I mentioned before that in general, there's no algorithm that will do this for you. But here's another tip that you can use. If you can express x, y, and z each in terms of lambda, then you could substitute those expressions into your constraint curve to get an equation with just one variable, just lambda. You could then solve for lambda and use that information to get x, y, and z. We're going to use this approach in our example. I'm going to start with equation 1, and I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by 2 lambda to write x equals 2 over lambda. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
Zach, didn't you just say in the last video, don't divide by a variable because you could divide by zero? Yeah, I did say that. And in general, that's good advice, but we don't really have much choice here. We should just make sure that lambda can't possibly be zero so that we're not committing a mathematical crime. And you can see from equation one that lambda really can't be zero. If lambda were zero, the right-hand side would be zero, and you could never have it equal to four. So note, lambda is not equal to zero here. Okay, since we know we're not doing anything bad by dividing by lambda, we can move on to our next equation. Equation two says that eight equals four lambda y. So if we divide by four lambda, we get y equals two over lambda. Similarly, in equation three, we have six equals two lambda z. If we divide by two lambda, we get z equals three over lambda. Okay, fantastic. We have expressions for x, y, z in terms of lambda. Let's now plug these into equation four. From equation four, we have two over lambda squared plus two times two over lambda squared plus three over lambda squared equals 756. Now you can see in the numerators here, we're gonna have four, eight, and nine. And if you add those up, you get 21. So the left-hand side becomes 21 over lambda squared equals 756. By rearranging this a little bit, we can write lambda squared equals 21 over 756, which is one over 36. And now we apply a square root. We find that there are two possibilities for lambda. Lambda is one over six or minus one over six. Okay, well, this is great. On the next slide, we're gonna use these values of lambda to compute x, y, and z. That's gonna give us two extreme points of our function along the boundary. Okay, we have two possibilities for lambda. Either lambda is a sixth or lambda is minus one sixth. In either case, our extreme point x, y, z can be found using our formulas from the last slide. X is two over lambda, Y is two over lambda, and Z is three over lambda. So when lambda is a sixth, our extreme point is two over a sixth, two over a sixth, three over a sixth, which gives us the point 12, 12, 18. If instead lambda is minus one sixth, well then the only difference here is the sign. Our extreme point is minus 12, minus 12, minus 18. Now this point might look a little bit weird, right? Minus 12, minus 12, minus 18? We can't make a negative number of snacks, so this point doesn't really make sense in the context of our problem. What's happening here, though, is that our method is computing the minimum possible profit. It's trying to make us lose money by giving us a negative output. And you can see this by plugging these points into our function. At 12, 12, 18, our profit function gives us four times 12 plus eight times 12 plus six times 18. That's a profit of $252. If you were to plug in the other point, the profit function would give you back minus $252. The function here doesn't know that x, y, and z have to be positive. We haven't built that into our problem. You could do this by adding more constraints, but that's not something we're going to focus on here. You can read more about it in the textbook. Finally, we have to ask ourselves, what about critical points inside the region, right? We've maximized and minimized our function on the boundary, but what about at critical points inside? Well, you can actually see here, our function isn't gonna have any critical points inside. The gradient of f is four, eight, six. So the partial derivatives exist everywhere, but they're never zero. So we don't have critical points to worry about. We therefore conclude that this point on the boundary is our global maximum. We reach a maximum profit of $252 by producing 12 units of snack one, 12 units of snack two, and 18 units of snack three. Actually, it makes a lot of sense that our maximum is occurring along the boundary. After all, if we found a maximum in the interior, it would mean that x squared plus two y squared plus z squared is strictly less than 756. So by increasing x, y, or z by just a little bit, we can stay within our constraint, but make a little bit more profit. So it makes sense that we've pushed ourselves all the way out to the boundary here. I'd like to end this video by quickly discussing the meaning of this Lagrange multiplier, lambda equals one sixth. What is this telling us in the context of our problem? Well, in general, the Lagrange multiplier tells you how sensitive your maximum and minimum values are to tiny changes in your constraint curve. 
For instance, in this problem, we're constrained by this number, 756. This expression involving x, y, and z can't get bigger than 756. But what would happen to our maximum and minimum values if we increase that to 757? Well, this Lagrange multiplier is telling us we should expect our profits to increase by about one-sixth of a dollar.